Go ahead. As livestock producers prepare to send their cattle to pasture, another very important consideration is what method of livestock pest control options are best suited for the upcoming grazing season. Livestock pest control should be viewed as having a positive impact on your operation. Here in Nebraska, we have three fly species that are economically impacting our pasture. cattle. They are the horn fly, face fly, and stable fly. We'll begin by visiting about the, the horn fly. This particular fly originated from the old world, uh, came into the Americas in uh, the early 1880s, and uh, later invaded South America uh, as uh, late as the 1980s. It is a uh, blood feeding fly. It spends most of its time on the backs of the hosts. Uh, it will develop strictly in straight cow manure. And um, it will feed approximately uh, 30 to 35 times per day. And the only time the female fly leaves the host is to deposit uh, eggs in fresh manure. And uh, there is significant dispersal of the flies among herds. The uh, dispersal of the horn fly was first thought to be somewhat limited within the herd, but uh, er, in the early 1980s we saw insecticide resistance develop to uh, the new um, ear tags, and we found that dispersal is uh, much greater than we first thought. In fact, uh, horn flies can uh, migrate or move at least three miles per day, and certainly farther uh, aided by wind. So they are very mobile. And a lot of the uh, dispersants are newly emerged females looking for a blood meal. Actually, uh, many people will look at their bulls and see many more horn flies on the bulls. And there's a, a big reason for that is because the horn fly is attracted to testosterone levels, high levels of testosterone, and certainly bulls uh, have a, a high degree of that, uh, that hormone. And uh, certainly uh, the stature of the animal having a thick neck prevents the animal from really throwing their head back and uh, dislodging the flies. Here is the uh, mouth part or the... Uh, what we call a proboscis of the horn fly. This is the this is the uh, object that they use to uh, penetrate the skin and, and absorb uh, the blood. Here's an example of uh, an animal uh, in Nebraska, a cow that has a representative population of horn flies, and we'll see horn fly populations like this uh, usually midsummer. Well, the economic importance of the horn fly uh, is certainly great. Uh, the greatest impact is on milk production and therefore the weaning weights of calves. And calf weaning weights uh, can be impacted negatively from anywhere from 4 to 15 percent. And in Nebraska studies on calf weaning weights, uh, we found uh, differences anywhere from 10 to 20 pounds. Uh, uh, difference between uh, cattle that received a fly treatment versus one without a fly treatment. Here's an example of a population of 503 flies. Uh, this is somewhat typical in, um, in mid-summer. Uh, you can often see numbers like this. As opposed to an animal that's carrying 179 flies, uh, this number would be well below the economic injury level of 200. How we go about estimating or uh, enumerating our flies, uh, we used to do it to visually, but uh, we have now adapted digital photography and uh, essentially snap a picture, then come back to the lab and count the flies on a computer program. This image shows uh, dots representing, uh, each dot actually representing a fly. So uh, it's much more precise in, 
getting the accurate number of flies per animal. There's been many studies uh, across the country uh, looking at the effect of horn flies uh, on weaning weights. So here are four notable studies that we see. And um, uh, you can see that uh, the production or the reduction in calf weights varies from uh, 3 to uh, 6 with an average of about 4.3%. This is a study uh, that we did here in Nebraska at our Goodman's and Sandhills Laboratory in the summer of 2000. And this was a 12-week study. We had the cows, uh, the mother cows, tagged with uh, an insecticide ear tag. And at the end of the 12 weeks, we weighed the calves and found an 18-pound difference between the mother cows that received treatment and the other mother cows that did not. So certainly impacting weaning weights. Well, how do we control the horn fly? Well, there's been several different methodologies used over the years. We have insect growth regulators or feed-throughs. Um, these uh, uh, work reasonably well. There are some issues with them. One uh, big issue is that the animals have to uh, steadily take a, a, a dose daily, get a regular dose daily of this product to really work. And it, uh, this methodology doesn't have an impact on flies that are moving in from your neighbors. So if you have a neighbor that does not protect their animals from horn flies, chances are you might get migrating flies in. So that's an issue with a feed through. Uh, animal sprays, uh, we uh, see a number of people that uh, resort to these. These have to be done uh, on a regular basis to maintain uh, the fly numbers below the economic injury level of 200. Uh, dust bags and oilers, here uh, you see a dust bag in a force use situation, and by far a force use system will provide anywhere from 25 to 50 percent better fly control than free choice. And the same thing applies to oilers and rubs. Uh, there are many other uh, compounds available for oilers and rubs, but to, to have them work effectively, they need to be forced use. Certainly one of the most effective management tools that uh, we have seen in the past 20-some years is the introduction of the insecticide ear tag. And this kind of revolutionized the uh, area of uh, horn fly control. Unfortunately, we did see insecticide development uh, occur, resistance uh, occurred back in the mid-80s. And uh, so we've been dealing with uh, resistance issues and resistant management. And um, we've made some strides into uh, handling this particular problem with rotation of insecticide classes. There's a number of different classes, and we'll talk about each one. Here is the, the first class of insecticide ear tags, the organophosphates. These tags listed here are ones that we recommend here in Nebraska. The synthetic pyrethroids uh, have been around for a number of years. Uh, the, these listed here are ones that uh, we uh, also recommend for use in, in Nebraska. There is a new uh, insecticide ear tag matrix. Uh, this is a corathon uh, with a fiber tech. This is an organophosphate ear tag. And then we also have a synthetic pyrethroid called Cyguard with fiber tech. Uh, this new matrix allows more uh, chemical uh, by weight to be included in the ear tag. The third uh, insecticide uh, class that we have is a new chemistry called macrocyxilic uh, lactone. Uh, most of you would probably recognize it as abamectin uh, related to the ivamectins. And uh, this has been uh, out for about five years. Here's a slide showing uh, some of our recent research with different ear tags. Uh, what I have listed here, uh, we looked at Warrior, a double barrel VP, Python Magnum, Python, and two different pastures with the XP820, which is the Avamectin tag. As you can see that um, some of the ear tags certainly uh, exceeded the economic injury level of 200 uh, in late July and early August. Uh, the XP820 and the Python tag 
certainly provided the uh, the best control. Ninety one percent reduction in horn flies with the XP uh, eight twenty, and we saw an eighty one percent reduction in horn flies with the Python. Here's a recent uh, study done in 2012. We looked at the XP820 again, Python, Magnum, and Python. Um, this study was uh, only conducted for 12 weeks due to the drought, so we had a shortened our study period. Uh, you can see that um, we had one ear tag here, the XP, or the, I should say the Magnum, Python Magnum did exceed the economic injury level of 200 in uh, early August, and um, the uh, Python and the XP A20 continued to provide reasonably good control through the remaining parts of the of the study. The uh, this slide shows actually four years of work uh, that we conducted with the XP A20 ear tag on horn, horn fly numbers in West Central Nebraska. And um, we're still getting very good control uh, from this particular tag. In fact, when you average the four years together, you get a, a percent reduction still exceeding 90%, which is really, really good. We do have some ear tag recommendations that you should uh, follow. Uh, we strongly urge you to delay tagging until fly numbers reach the economic injury level of 200 that being in late May or early June. We strongly urge you to use the correct number of ear tags that's recommended on the label of the product. Tag all the adult animals in the herd. Remove the old tags at the end of the season. And you need to rotate your chemical classes yearly. That means you go from an organophosphate to a synthetic pyrethroid to an abamectin tag uh, in that, uh, not in that necessarily in that order, but you need to rotate to a different chemical class each year to reduce the chances of getting uh, horn fly resistance. And certainly if uh, your control fails, uh, if failure is obvious, you need to uh, go to another method of control. We do have a new larvicide uh, for combating the horn fly. Uh, that is called Clarify, and it contains an active ingredient called Dimelin or Diflubenzeron. It's an insect growth uh, erupt or disruptor. It uh, disrupts the development of the uh, fly larva. It is effective on the house fly, horn fly, and face fly. So it is one that uh, you can possibly use in, the, in your rotation system. All right, uh, we go now into face flies. Um, this has been a, an issue, uh, certainly historically, in the eastern part of the, of the state of Nebraska. Uh, more recently here, we've had some issues out in west central Nebraska when we've had uh, wet years. Uh, the face fly here again is a native to Africa and Europe, and it was introduced into the United States in the early 1950s. And, uh, certainly has been a problem since then. Uh, this particular fly develops in fresh cow manure. Uh, the female will lay its eggs in that uh, manure very quickly and development uh, initiates thereafter. Uh, its life cycle is very similar to uh, a house fly. Uh, the thing about the face fly is that it takes three weeks to complete the life cycle, go from egg to an adult. And that's very important uh, out here in the west central area of the, of the state is because when we get a traditional uh, summer, we normally get uh, uh, very warm temperatures and dry conditions. And normally that disrupts the, uh, the life cycle where the cow pat dries out so quickly before it completes its development and therefore kills the flies. However, that was not the case in 2011 when we had a very wet uh, summer. We had uh, significant horn fl or uh, face fly numbers and face fly issues that year. The face fly will feed uh, around the eyes uh, of animals, as you see here. 
as well as around the, the nasal area of the discharges uh, from, the, uh, from the nose. It will also feed on bison as well as horses. The face fly uh, feeding is actually done by the female, and the female needs to visit the animal to get protein to develop uh, uh, the new batch of eggs and this protein is obtained from the secretions around the eye and, uh, and the nose. Uh, the eye feeding, as you see in these pictures here, really uh, sets up uh, the area for uh, damage uh, and uh, for a pathway for uh, bacteria, in particularly the bacteria that causes pink eye, Moraxella bovis. Now, also, uh, the feeding of this particular fly is short-lived. They're not on the animal very long, so it's more difficult to provide face fly control because they limit their, uh, their visits or their time to the animal. When they're not visiting the animal, they are offsetting uh, in vegetation and feeding on sugars uh, from flower nectars or honeydew. The male fly, face fly, does not visit the animal. In fact, here's a picture of, the, of a male fly sitting on a fence post waiting for a female to come by so that they can mate. The uh, male only feeds on um, flowers. Well, the issue with uh, face fly is certainly uh, the uh, mechanical uh, vectoring of the pink eye bacteria Moraxella bovis. And uh, this can really cause some issues in uh, cattle, especially younger animals, and here's a picture of, of a damaged eye. It also can be a biological vector of uh, the eye worm that's usually found in the mountainous states. Now, <clears throat> we do have uh, several different types of uh, pink eye vaccines that are available, and if you are experiencing uh, Historically, uh, pink eye problems, you, it would be great for you to consult with your local veterinarian to get uh, uh, his recommendation or her recommendation on, on the right vaccine because you can get some benefit from a uh, pink eye vaccine. How do we control uh, face flies? Well, we're going to be using many of the same type of uh, control methods that we used in uh, uh, controlling the horn fly. Back rubbers and oilers, uh, dust bags, uh, oral larvicides, and uh, insect growth regulators uh, will work. Um, if you're looking at uh, an in the insect growth regulator Altocid, it is not labeled for face flies, so you will not get any benefit for face fly control using that particular IGR. Here again, back rubbers, oilers, and dust bags to get the most effect from these you need to force use uh, these particular methods. Certainly the methodology that provides the, the best control or the, the most reduction in face fly numbers would, that, would be that of the ear tag. And the same ear tags that are used in horn fly control can be used on face fly control. Uh, one thing though that you, also, you have to protect all the animals uh, in your herd and that includes calves when it comes to uh, face fly control because the face fly will feed on both the adults as well as the young animals. There's another issue that we have with the face fly and that is uh, the overwintering of this fly. It overwinters as an adult and this causes some issues in the fall. Uh, the face fly will seek out shelter normally in uh, homes or buildings uh, with attics, and they will come in in the fall and uh, overwinter in the attic. And uh, that causes problems later in the wintertime, as you see here in this picture. When we do get some of those warm-ups in uh, uh, February, uh, late January, uh, the flies become active where they're overwintering. They find a way down into the living area of a home and uh, are essentially plastered against the, the windows trying to get outside. So they uh, are a nuisance in that way. And I know during the uh, 
uh, winter of 2011, we had entertained many calls regarding this particular fly species uh, being a nuisance in homes. So this is another issue with the face fly. We're going to move on now to the uh, stable fly, uh, stable flies on pastured cattle. The stable fly uh, is again uh, was brought in from uh, the old world, uh, that being Africa and uh, Europe, and uh, it uh, has been here for uh, quite a few years. It is a fly that uh, also takes a blood meal, and uh, its average lifespan is some two to three weeks. The mouth parts are similar to that of the horn fly. Um, this here is a um, electron microscopy of the mouth part of the fly, what we call the proboscis, and this area right here is the labella of, or the tip of that uh, proboscis, and you can see that uh, these teeth here uh, are uh, can uh, cause some real pain when they're cutting through the skin, and that's where some of the pain is involved when you are bitten or when an animal is bitten by the, the stable fly. The life cycle is similar to that of uh, a house fly, except it's a little bit longer. It uh, takes anywhere from 15 to 20 days to go from uh, egg to an adult. How did uh, the stable fly get named? Well, many years ago in the early 17, 1800s, uh, we used a lot of horses. They were stabled nearby, and those flies uh, are uh, found indicative in the habitat there where you have uh, stables, where you get the mixture of the manure and the straw, and so that's how the fly was named. They are uh, vigorous flyers. They will move uh, considerable distance, and um, they disperse from or between livestock facilities, uh, and uh, this dispersal is fairly substantial. And uh, there is some research being conducted to see exactly how far they can go. In some studies, we've seen movement as far as 50 miles. And uh, that stable fly dispersion, in fact, may be even greater than that. There is a couple of schools of thought that uh, our spring uh, stable fly numbers may originate from our southern states, uh, like Oklahoma and Kansas and even Texas, that we get a lot of our weather fronts that we might move this particular fly up into our region. But uh, we still have not proven that school of thought yet. Well, the stable fly develops not in straight cow manure, but in actually organic matter. Uh, and uh, recent work conducted at the University of Missouri looking at round bale feeding show that we have a lot of uh, hay wasted uh, by uh, feeding the round bales either in a, in a unrolled position uh, or in a ring or a stack up to 30% uh, uh, using a hay ring. Well, when you get the right type of moisture, which our southern states, especially Missouri and Kansas and Actually, southeast uh, Nebraska certainly has adequate moisture. You get a complex that looks similar to this. This area right here, where my pointer is, is excellent uh, area for stable fly production. This is localized production, and uh, this can certainly be a source of stable fly generation for your pastured cattle. The stable fly also develops in other substrates, such as uh, fermenting algae found on beaches or sugarcane bagasse, even compost piles and grass clippings in urban environments, such that we see in this particular photo right here. So it doesn't take a lot of material uh, to generate a stable fly uh, population. Uh, the limiting factor is always the, the moisture. And here's a picture that I took uh, several years ago up at our uh, ranch at uh, Goodmanson uh, near Whitman, Nebraska. 
This picture here was taken early in the morning out about seven miles from headquarters, and you can see that uh, we are in a sandy environment. All these flies pictured here are stable flies. And looking around in the pasture, we did not see any area that would uh, actually hold stable fly production. So these flies came in from some other area. So they will move, and that's the biggest problem that we have in trying to control the stable fly is trying to find where they're developing and coming from. Here's a picture of an animal that uh, is out in pasture and is a, a carrying a considerable number of, of stable flies. Well, we do know that uh, stable flies feeding on pasture cattle causes them to bunch. Here's an example. Of, uh, of this situation. Also, the uh, effect of stable flies on pasture cattle, they disrupt uh, grazing patterns and also reduce weight gains. This study here, there's a table of uh, results from a study uh, that was conducted here at our uh, laboratory at North Platte during the late 1990s. We did a three-year study looking at the effect of stable fly on average daily gains of grazing steers. And at the end of that three-year study, uh, we found that uh, animals that uh, provided or received a treatment for stable flies gained on average 0.44 pounds more per day than the animals that received no treatment. So highly significant impacting fly on our uh, pastured cattle. Well, how do we control this particular fly? Well, that, that is the $64,000 question. We've talked about dust bags and oilers and ear tags. Unfortunately, these methodologies really don't work that well because you have to direct your treatment toward the legs. And these uh, three treatments uh, really do not work that well. Feed additives are not effective because the stable fly will develop in organic material, uh, not straight cow manure. So that's a big issue. Animal sprays will work. Uh, you do have to gather your animal in, and that can cause a problem. Uh, it certainly increases stress and is more time consuming, but animal sprays will help reduce stable fly numbers. We uh, did look at the use of a mist blower which actually is a piece of equipment that um, was used in uh, feedlots and has been used in feedlots for many, many years. And here's a picture of a mist blower sprayer uh, mounted in a pickup and actually is taken out to the pasture and the animals are sprayed in the pasture so you don't have to bring the animals in. We did a three-year study using this particular treatment methodology and found that uh, we reduced uh, stable fly numbers by 72% using this particular treatment methodology. Well, you can also reduce localized stable fly development into your winter hay feeding sites, uh, either by sanitation, where you clean up the, the residue and haul it away, uh, or by applying a product called Neparex, which is cyromazine. It is a insect growth uh, disruptor. It disrupts the development of the stable fly larvae. However, with that said, the implementation of either sanitation or applying uh, Neparex may not reduce the total impact of the stable fly feeding in your pasture area because the stable flies can come in from other areas. But, it, if you, but it is a possibility uh, to use uh, this particular method uh, if you have uh, a number of these hay rings and can localize the stable fly development area. Well, we're continuing to do various types of uh, research using different treatment methodologies and focusing on uh, fly repellents, uh, fly traps, and, uh, and leg bands to try to offset the, uh, the stable fly problem in uh, our pasture settings. So 
So we will continue to work on uh, this problem and hope to find a treatment methodology which is uh, both, both efficacious and inexpensive for our livestock producers uh, here in Nebraska. If you have any questions regarding uh, fly control in, uh, in pastures, uh, I'd be glad to